lecture and support begins in three, two, one. Hey everybody, welcome back uh, to Nurture and Support. I'm Kelly Toole at K-E-L-L-Y-T-H-U-L. And with me as always is Mel. Hey everybody, it's Mel at Karmic9 on Twitter. And it's great to be back. Yeah, for episode number eight. Uh, also, uh, we'll be available, of course, on nurtureandsupport.net. Follow that at NurtAndSup on Twitter, and you'll find links to it. Search iTunes and leave us glowing reviews. So those will be all different places you can, can find the podcast. But if you're listening to it, I suspect you've already successfully done so. So, awesome. <laughs> uh I kind of realized as I got through that, I was like, yeah, I think this would probably be unnecessary information to a listener. <laughs> we probably never is. know. We, we need all the help we can get, you know, with those knitting ca- podcasts who yeah. are, um, you know, beating us. <laughs> that, yeah, we, we, a plea from Mel and I <laughs> is that uh, the category that we selected to put um, uh, the podcast in on iTunes is, uh, uh, is it Hobbies, Mel? Hobbies, is that? yes. Hobbies. Hobbies. So uh, seemed like a good idea at the time, but an unintended consequence is that we get to kind of see some other podcasts in that category around us who are performing uh, better than our podcast in terms of downloads, and many of those are knitting podcasts, <laughs> and, and uh, it's a humbling moment for us, and we'd like to take those knitting podcasts down. So. Yeah, I like knitting, but but really... Come on, yeah. <laughs> so if you could, you know, tell your friends to help help us out. <laughs> Download right. the podcast. Help us help us crush those knitters. I don't know what the like bad name for a knitter is, <laughs> you know, like a, but <laughs> knitters. I don't know. We'll have to, yeah, but you have up. to be careful. They have sharp needles. So Yeah, that's true. And Alice Cooper a recommendation from last show used to wear bright red knitting needles through his hair, um, in one of his many different outfits. So nice. it's kind of samurai, crazy looking Aunt Alice. So it's kind of a nice thing. So, cool. But we digress. As usual, Mel and I are going to offer some recommendations on all sorts of things. We'll go back and forth and finish off at the tail end with a couple of Twitter recommendations for everybody. And I get to start, and I am going to start with a book, uh, actually a series of books. There's lots of them for you to choose from. It's the Retief series by Keith Lawmer. Uh, You'll hear more from Keith later, uh, a future recommendation. He's done some other work that I like quite a bit. But the Retief series is uh, one of my my favorites of all time. Mel has, on past podcasts, uh, offered up a lot of interesting trilogies and and other books that have layers of nuance and complexity, and you've got to kind of be tuned in to know what you're doing, to listen to it, pay attention. You'd have none of that with the Retief series. It is it is the most leisure reading possible. You can kind of stay vaguely aware and enjoy them. Uh, it is Retief is it's a science fiction series, and Retief is a pan galactic diplomat, and he's kind of James Bondy, and all those types of things. And uh, he always comes out on top uh, in in the process. And there's all sorts of, of interesting alien races. The main kind of counterpoint to him. Uh, or his his uh, uh, diplomatic core is a race called the Grossi. The Grossi basically you could view as the Klingons of the Retief world, and the Klingons, of course, were the Russia of the real world. So it's that kind of idea of the the cold glue of the Cold War. The Grossis are kind of Klingon USSR that type of thing from there. Um, but uh, very humorous books. Uh, he's surrounded by all sorts of pompous administrators who don't know how to do things right. He always comes in, saves the day, figures it out. It's always fairly entertaining. Possibly my favorite part of the whole series, or the whole one of the favorite concepts in this series, uh, is that uh, a lot of the diplomatic communications occur through excruciatingly detailed facial gestures. Uh, that they just kind of would, okay. they'd cast a look at each other, and that look conveyed a certain amount of information. And they were um, trained in these, and they actually had uh, numbers assigned to them, so they're they're, they're actually coded uh, in through there. So I thought I'd give Mel a little quiz here, see how well she does in knowing her um, uh, pangalactic diplomat Uh-oh. facial expressions. So Mel, do you know what a 17 Y is? Hmm. 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 There's a there there's an a leak in the reactor core. 
No, that's the expectations of great things in due course. So you cast okay. that look at somebody and you're conveying to them that you have expectations of great things to come for them in due course. I'll give you another okay. shot. They were close there. How about a 12.7-X? The red shirts are coming? Nope, that's a knew, it, knew you had it in you, fella. That's a, <laughs> um, how about the, uh, the 3-V? The 3-V. Hmm. That's no moon. <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, no, it's modest awareness of virtue. Uh, so, uh, and so they have these are one of hundreds of these different expressions that they go through and and um, it uh, it's pretty um, pretty humorous to go in sorry about the pop quiz didn't, didn't think it was a good chance it. I didn't know I didn't know I didn't know there was going to be a test <laughs> yes. so how do you spell how do you spell his name so Retief um, is uh, spelled R-E-T-I-E-F okay uh, it's actually, so there's the uh, apocryphal version of what it is, which is fi kind of an, a version of fighter spelled backwards. That's been out there for a while, but actually it, it's a, uh, there's some South uh, African roots to some families, the Retief family and those types of things where that, that there was some background on there. But uh, it's, So there's like Retief and the Warlords, Retief to the Rescue, Here Comes Retief, all those types of things. So um, many of them are in short story format. Awesome for me, you know, given my kind of <laughs> reading issues. Uh, so you can get through them quick. Um, some of the others run a little bit. Uh, they're more novel length. Uh, so you'll get all sorts of those various uh, facial gestures to learn in one of those books uh, from there. Um, I would say uh, there, there's a lot of good ones. If I were to pick one, probably Retief to the Rescue would be a good place to start. That's more of a novel length one, and it's a pretty, pretty fun one. Uh, and uh, the two warring, he gets on a, um, a uh, planet where there's two warring factions, uh, the Creepies and the Crawlies, and uh, he kind of helps resolve it. So, so it's not subtle humor. Uh, it's, uh, like I said, you don't, not layers within layers, but it's a good fun read. Um, mm -hmm. And you can, you can, if you'd rather just kind of work through a couple short stories. Uh, fun fact, Keith Lawmer, um, uh, you know, he's never... You basically, through one of the books, learned that Retief is probably six foot three, six foot three tall. So he's a tall guy, and based on the activities he does, skiing, swimming, all these other types of things, probably physically fit. But that's about it for description. Um, and when the later s series were coming out on paperback, the publisher began to publish, uh, you know, an image of Retief on the cover. And Lawmer had always envisioned Retief as kind of a James Bond-esque looking guy, dark hair, mm -hmm. uh, and all those types of things. Um, but uh, Retief in uh, the, the book covers was coming out as a, a blonde-haired gentleman, which was a bit puzzling to him and did not where he thought. But the reason I brought that up is that the model for Retief during those, uh, those periods was Corbin Bernston. The, uh, wow. The, uh, so not in his uh, psych dad <laughs> look, but yeah. back in his more his Arnie Becker lawyer look kind of thing. Yeah. But, uh, but Corbin Bernstein acted uh, was was apparently served as the model for the Retief uh, illustrations on the covers of the books. So there's a little fun fact for you on Retief. So, cool. So uh, how we'll, old are these books? When as, I, as I haven't heard of them. Well, so thank you, Mel. Well, no, <laughs> I'm, they, I'm not, I don't mean anything by that. They, I just. It's, not something I'm aware of. They came out, so they started, they, they ran for about 30, you know, not every year, of course, but for about 30 years, kind of in the, started, 25 years at least, started in the late 60s and into the 90s was when Law okay. wrote most of these. Uh, so, yeah, there's not new Retief coming out. I do think you could probably pull a fairly interesting uh, low-budget movie out of several of the Retiefs. Mm -hmm. Maybe sci-fi should tune into that a little bit. Pretty but, yeah, sure. they, they uh, late 60s, go, running all the way up and through... Um, uh, actually, 2000, and, uh, well, the last original one, I believe, was 1993, Retief and the Rascals. Uh, so there you go. Good. Um, so hmm. there's there's uh, my first recommendation for today. That's cool. And they might be in the they might be in the public domain, at least the older ones now. That's a great Hard point. To say. Could be. We'll have to, we'll have to check that out and see if uh, they're available on Project Gutenberg or something if they are in the public domain. If they're not, we'll try to find some links for you. That's cool. I hadn't heard of those. That's amazing. Maybe we should change this podcast to um, the literature category. 
<laughs> and we're then, talking then we're about gonna, books all the time. Yeah, and then we're going to get beaten by books on limericks or something like that. It'll be, well, probably. <laughs> probably. Oh, because I also have a book this week. I actually have, let me see, 15 books. This is a big series. Um, I think there are more Retiefs, so I win. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's good. I'll Funny how that works out. We both have big book series to talk about. Absolutely. Um, mine is The Dresden Files by Jim Butcher. Uh, you can find Jim Butcher's website at jim-butcher.com. He has a couple of uh, book series out, but he lists all the Dresden Files books on there. There are 14 books out. The 15th book, Skin Game, will be releasing on May 27th. So even if you're a super fast reader, you probably aren't going to get through all of this series in time for Skin Game to come out. But this has to be one of my all-time favorite series ever. And for me, it's really hard to maintain a good interest level through that many books. I can't think off the top of my head of another series that I have really just loved this much and loved a character this much through this many books. The series is about a wizard named Harry Dresden, and this is technically urban fantasy. He is the only wizard in the phone book. It's based in mostly Chicago, and his ad in the phone book reads, Harry Dresden, wizard, lost items found, paranormal investigations, consulting, advice, reasonable rates, no love potions, endless purses, parties, or other entertainment. Uh, he lives in a world where the general public does not believe in wizards or dragons or fairies or goblins or vampires or anything like that. It is basically our world, and he happens to be a wizard. There are wizards living among us, hidden from us, and he's kind of mm, youngish for a wizard. He's been in some trouble with the Wizard White Council. And they're always staring at him, looking for him to mess up. And they don't tolerate wizards to misuse their power. They chop their heads off. So he's living under this doom of Damocles and has to watch what he does. But we always walk around thinking, you know, oh, wizards and books, they're rich. Well, Harry is dirt broke. So, obviously, he has an ad in the phone book. He's a wizard private detective for the most part and he ends up doing consultations with the Chicago Police Department for weird cases that come up and that's how you meet our other mm, pretty much essential character to the books I think she's in every every book and this would be Lieutenant Karen Murphy uh, she's basically you can kinda consider her sorta of Harry's partner but this book series starts out as pretty pretty fun pretty lighthearted it's a pretty easy read and as the books go on Harry grows and and his his personality changes a bit all in a a very believable way as you would expect a character that goes through a lot of horrible things that happen to him would change the first book in the series um, is called Stormfront and this is one of those series that you do need to start at the beginning. Don't try to jump in on a new book. You're not going to... It might be entertaining, but you're not going to get all the backstory. And it's really important, especially as the series goes on in the later books, to know all of the horrible things that have gone on before. Because Harry goes through a lot. Harry is the... He's kind of a punching bag for the paranormal. He's a badass wizard, but he gets into a lot, a lot of trouble. And he has one of the other great characters of this series is he has Bob the Skull. Bob is an air elemental who lives in an old human skull. And he was owned by Harry's uh, foster father, so to speak, who ended up being kind of an evil wizard. And Bob knows everything, but he's also got a little porn addiction. So... Should Okay, 
quite, lots of questions are coming up. <laughs> several, several of which I'm gonna, I'm gonna save uh, and, and not advance. But shouldn't he be Bob who lives in a skull versus Bob the skull if he's an air elemental? No, they just call him Bob. But okay. you know, we, we cool. call him Bob. We call him, kind of call him Bob the skull because he, he, uh, when he talks to Harry. He he lights up the eye holes of the skull, so it's kind of like the skull is is talking when he's talking to Harry. But um, he he basically knows just about everything. He's eons old. He almost serves the purpose of Google to Harry because in this world, wizards don't get along with electronics. So Harry cannot use a smartphone. He can't use a computer. He drives an old beat-up VW Bug because he can't even drive modern cars with all the computer chips in them because if he gets anywhere close to something technologically advanced, it ends up sort of blowing up. And that's because wizards use all of, have all of this you know, personal energy, and it interferes with electronics. So he can't get online and Google things that he wants to know. But Bob pretty much knows everything, so he kind of serves the purpose of the Internet for Harry. Which explains the porn. Which explains the porn. Um, as a reward, when Bob does good, he, he gets him a new trashy romance novel to read. It's a lot of comic relief in the books. Bob is a great He's a great character. He's one of the most popular characters. In the book, which is some of the complaints of some of the later books when he wasn't in them as much, some people I saw a lot of uh, a lot of complaints online that Bob wasn't in there enough anymore. So let me see. There are also some graphic novels out. I don't think they've progressed very far past the first book, and though I know they're working on completing all of them, but that's a lot of books to get through, and graphic novels, it usually takes, I don't know, 10 of them, to e 10 issues to even get through one book, because these aren't, the early books aren't nearly as massive as the later books become, but this is a world that deals with fairies, um, angels, demons, through the course of the series, they touch on pretty much every every paranormal-ish, supernatural sort of creature you could ever come across. But it starts out pretty tame. But I just will tell you that through the course of this series, if you, uh, if you stick with Harry, you'll come across flying monkeys, which are very, very entertaining, demonic flying monkeys. And there is a scene where uh, Harry rides a dinosaur, a T-Rex skeleton, through the streets of Chicago. So it's highly entertaining. Very cool. Unfortunately, they did try to turn the series into a television show many years ago, and uh, Harry Dresden was played by Paul Blackthorne. I don't, I don't know if you know who he is off the top of your head. He's in Arrow right now. He was also in that show, The River, that didn't make it very long either. But I liked The River. A lot of people didn't though. But it was it was good, but it inevitably got canceled as any show I particularly like. So the good news is is that the TV rights have reverted back to the author, and so he hasn't ruled out them trying a movie or another television series, which I think this would be a really good movie or television series. Actually, it just didn't get uh, it didn't get treated the way that it should be treated for the TV show. So it just didn't do very well. But like another wizard named Harry, I think people will really enjoy the uh, the trials and tribulations of Harry Dresden. He's kind of an, of an everyman hero with immense wizardly powers towards the end of the book. And he tries to do good, but a lot of times ends up causing more problems than he initially started out with. Looks uh, looks pretty cool, and I was I was consulting my air elemental inside a skull over here while you were talking. Uh huh. Uh, and uh, Driss of the dr yeah. So now, as you started to talk about it, I was like, wasn't there a d TV series Dresden mm -hmm. that I was trying to connect? But uh, I've not I've not uh, connected with either the 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 books or the 
or the the television season, which looks like it was uh, around 2007 or so. So that looks yeah. You'll I'll shockingly start with the book. These sound pretty. Sound actually really cool. You'll you'll see me and um, T. Scott Brave and Jay Hallmeyer on Twitter talking about them. We're all fans of the book series, and we're fans of the television show, which got canceled. And you'll see us squeeing over May 27th. We'll be here soon with the 15th book in the series. So it's amazing to me that any series that goes on that long maintains a, a high level um, and keeps the characters interesting. Most most of the series that I've tried to read, like, oh, I don't know, Anita Blake, end up getting really trashy around book eight and pretty much unreadable after that, which is a fun fact while I was looking stuff up for this I found that Anita Blake is actually the series that inspired this oh. but that was before Anita Blake got really crappy <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it was a good well, time to inspire I, I guess no and the, the Anita Blake series I really enjoyed at the beginning but um and who knows I think she's still working on it it may have turned back around and gotten better but it it lost me in the middle so I think people will enjoy Dresden Files. It's an urban fantasy set in our world where you basically have sort of a private investigator who is a wizard and has to find ways to work within our world to deal with supernatural elements of things that are going on without getting thrown in the loony bin and, and losing all of his friends because he doesn't really have very many friends. Eventually, he gets a really big dog named Mouse, who's oh. the size of a pony. Mouse is a really good character. Um, and there are vampires. There are vampires in this series, but they're not quite like other vampires. There's three different types of vampires, actually, and not all of them feed off of blood. So it gets very convoluted, but he does a really good job in the series of explaining the different worlds. There are pretty much everything. There's fairies, good fairies, bad fairies, little, tiny, little, devilish fairies, evil cats, the whole thing. You even get a few werewolves thrown in. So I think people will enjoy it if they are a fan of urban fantasy, and they should give it a try if they haven't by now. Well, so let me shoot you a 52E look, which is genuine interest that may actually result in follow-up. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so that would be this look. So, um, okay. awesome, yeah, and so interesting, I mean, some parallels between our first two recommendations in terms of uh, a large number. The, I think probably one of the, the bigger distinction is uh, from the Retief series. Retief is unencumbered by backstory. Uh, basically, it, uh, it's similar scenarios and similar players on each one, and pretty quick in each book they establish. He's got it going on, he's too cool, his superiors are bumbling idiots, mm -hmm. and this diplomatic corps is very structured, and they have all these looks, and they start rolling them out. But you, they don't really build on each other, so you can you can just kind of pick around there mm -hmm. uh, and whatever you want to. But this sounds really great. So I um, ha I was not aware uh, beyond I had heard of Dresden Files, the TV series, but uh, so that's cool, excellent. The early books are a real quick or well real quick read. The books get pretty massive towards the end, but the first five or six are, are real quick reads before he starts really building on the story. It's a very good example of how a character changes through time. The entire series is an excellent character study of how Harry is affected by the things that he has to do to save people and the trouble that he gets into by saving people always causes more trouble, and it's a great character study. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so the next, I'll go uh, with my second here for, for this show. And um, this one, uh, I'm going to uh, provide with a surprise and a question. 
So the surprise part is I'm actually making a recommendation of something that occurred in this decade. So that's a lot of my, <laughs> lot of my recommendations. I've been kind of back a little bit uh, on some things. Still worthwhile, but uh, a little bit more vintage. This one's actually uh, a little more contemporary, proud to say. Uh, but uh, that kind of then brings into my question, which is I was getting ready. We, we try on the blog to um, categorize uh, our recommendations, books, mm -hmm. apps, music, those types of things. Um, so what, I, what I'm going to talk about uh, next um, is House of Cards, uh, which is a Netflix series. Um, and so <laughs> it's not a movie. It's not a TV show. What do you what do you call these things? This was this was a, a series uh, that Netflix secured. It's original programming. Um, I think at the awards they just consider them basically maybe like cable. Maybe they put them in the cable series section. So that because we have a category to figure out, Mel. Because <laughs> this yeah. we had to put it in something. Maybe it, maybe cable series is. I don't know. We'll figure it out. When you, yep. when you see the blog post, you'll, you'll find out what we decided on. But uh, but it is House of Cards uh, is, is my next recommendation. And it's intriguing on a couple fronts. It's It uh, it wasn't Netflix's first uh, commission series. They've had a couple of them. But this is one that was created uh, and then distributed uh, initially and I think exclusively through Netflix. And then I think you, I, I think you can probably get DVDs for it uh, now as well or Blu-ray. And it was based off of, as many things are, uh, an English series by the same name, which was House of Cards, which was a, uh, a different political structure, but uh, it actually had three seasons under different names. But it was patterned loosely after it, where the main protagonist is a uh, fairly conniving politician. Uh, one of the most interesting things to me about House of Cards is Netflix's approach to it, and it comes into this whole kind of binge viewing deal mm -hmm. that folks go through now is that uh, House of Cards gets released February 14th uh, of this year, the second season. Okay. Uh, uh, upon release, you're going to get all 13 episodes in one shot, and then you can just go through it at whatever pace you want to. So when House of Cards came out first season, boom, you come, you go into it, and there's, there's 13 shows. They run about 50 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin Spacey plays the lead character who's Frank Underwood who's a uh, senator from South Carolina. He's actually the majority, the House Majority Whip. So he's a representative, I guess, from South Carolina. But uh, he's the House Majority Whip, uh, who at the first episode find out he was screwed over for being nominated as vice president. That the guy who was running for president, this guy had a lot of juice. He was helping him do well. There were all indications where he was going to get the vice presidential nod. It went to somebody else. And... So he sets about correcting that. <laughs> That's a lot of a lot of his uh, activity in the first season. Uh, so Kevin Spacey uh, is Frank Underwood. Fantastic, does a fantastic job as a character. I like it. Some people don't. He uh, one of the kind of uniquenesses about it is that uh, it breaks the third. Uh, breaks the was it third or fourth wall? Uh, but anyway, he addresses the audience directly. Uh, okay. From time to time, so there'll be an inner, you know, there'll be this. They're in the, they're in the throes of a, a big debate or something like that. Or he just does something, and as he's walking out the room, he turns, looks square in the camera, and then basically like he's talking to you, filling in. You know, yeah, some people are like this, and other people like that. This is how I do things, and those types of things. And he does that with some regularity. He's the only character in the in the whole series that does that. Mm -hmm. And there's some pretty. Um, it's a he's an interesting character. He's got this nice southern drawl going, and he's a mean guy. <laughs> and and he he kind of talks he uh, kind of talks through things. And there's also been some pretty awesome parodies of those kind of direct to the audience voiceovers uh, as Frank Underwood, uh, which I would simulate for you simulate for you, but I would do very very poorly at it, so I won't. But they're pretty funny. But anyway, Robin Wright who uh, has come a long way from Princess Buttercup. In Princess Bride is his wife. It's somewhat of a marriage of convenience. She's a big activist on clean water and some things there. and there It's a partnership to get certain things done. There is there is affection. That's kind of clear. Uh, I don't know if they're exactly the tightest family unit ever uh, mm -hmm. uh, from there. But it, uh, 
it's pretty riveting stuff. And I, I just remember back uh, a little while ago we were talking where you had kind of mused to say, did, did Breaking Bad ruin television for you in terms of you start yeah. to get used to a certain level of acting and mm -hmm. writing and cinematography, and then when other shows kind of don't hit on all cylinders, uh, it can be a little disappointing. This um, this might hold up pretty well to that test. Um, hmm. I think the acting is, you know, probably... Yeah, it's high bar, and uh, the acting's pretty equally strong, particularly with the leads. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if the cast is necessarily as deep as Breaking Bad with the characters and all that. Uh, Are there the, Star Trek reenactment and scripts? <laughs> not, not that I've seen. Not yet. Actually, no, not yet. And and I was thinking about that before we came on today. I was um, in a little bit because I was going to make the comparison to Breaking Bad. Probably the other big difference is. I, I think this is a show that's devoid of comic relief. Uh-oh. It is a drama, and okay. you kind of run through there. I mean, the comic relief a little bit is when he's addressing you, and, and you get mm -hmm. there, there's there's some points where there's a there's a, a dark humor to what's going on, but uh, there's no Saul Goodman. There's there's no pie-eating contest on the Enterprise or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that's, that's unfortunate. And then Kate Mara, who was in the first season of um, American Horror Story, uh, is also plays a, a, a reporter uh, who gets kind of entwined in this. And, um, she spends a little too much quality time with Kevin Spacey in a creepy way, but uh, outside of that, um, mm -hmm. she's good. I like her. Uh, she does a pretty good job. So, so it is. It's there for the taking on Netflix. Uh, get through that. You get that first season, uh, thirteen episodes. Uh, you'll you'll probably find yourself going ah just one more ah just one more <laughs> and kind of getting through there and see what goes on. There's some interesting twists and turns. It kind of cliffhangs a little bit at the end. So by recommending it now, if you get started on it, be of good cheer because the new ones come rolling right out on February 14th. Uh, so um, and you'll get all okay. 13. You can binge view to your heart's content. So if you watch the first episode, is that going to be is that pretty much going to tell you what it's about, or is it going to be one of those shows that you really need to get two or three in before you, you get hooked? Do you feel like it, it hooked you from the beginning? Uh, I feel it hooked me from the beginning, and I, I, I feel it really laid out. So you get a few more characters, you know, as you get a little deeper into it, you get more depth on a few additional characters. Mm -hmm. uh, Frank Underwood, the Kevin Spacey character, is the, the core of this show. Uh, and so and, uh, so you, you pick up pretty quick what kind of he's about and how it's going to kind of work with him. So you'll get – that first episode's a really good you – know, sometimes, like for Breaking Bad, I said, hey, you need to get through a couple of them before you can really get the, the whole gist of it. I would say that for, you watch the first episode of House of Cards, and you've got a, a pretty good feel for how this thing's going to go and whether it's okay. going to be something you're going to like or not. Okay. Well, on your recommendation – I will try it. I'm not really into political shows, but since you're gonna you're gonna throw out Breaking Bad for it, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that you know I'm not saying it's better. I won't because <laughs> it isn't. It's not better than Breaking Bad. Uh, but uh, when we talk about you know when you and I've talked about it in the past a little bit of what you then when you watch some other things what you see missing. Right. It has less of that. I mean, but I think it's okay. because it is very strong cast. It doesn't have some of the amazing visuals that, although there are a few actually. Uh, in it, but you know, Breaking Bad's so awesome. How who who could compete? But right. I would say esque, Breaking Bad esque. Okay. <laughs> so. On that, on the the strength of that glowing recommendation, I will give it a shot. I, I've seen it on Netflix. I just have never tried it because I don't particularly go for the uh, political shows. So I'll give it a try. So my next recommendation is a music one. Um, and I swear I don't only listen to strange music, but uh, I feel like pretty much everybody probably listens to about the same music I generally listen to. So I feel like sharing with all of you eh, some stuff that might be on the fringe that you might not know about. So my recommendation this week is an artist named Peter Hollins, and that's H-O-L-L-E-N-S. You can find him at his website, peterhollins.com. He also is very, very active on YouTube. All of his songs um, he usually has a video for, and you can watch them all for free on YouTube to see if you like his stuff before you try to get a CD. 
He's very much an independent artist, but his channel name on YouTube is his name, Peter Holland. So if you do a search for that, you'll get his channel to come up. He is an a cappella singer, and he got his basically his his start, at least in the public eye of most people, on the sing off. Did, did you ever watch the sing off, Kelly? Uh, so that's the that's the a cappella contest, right? Yeah, with, with Ben with Folds and yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Okay, he was in a group in season two, which to me was the best season of the sing off. Personally, it's my favorite. Um, he was in a group called On the Rocks, and they were they were a fun group. They didn't win, but they did um, they did an acapella cover of Bad Romance by Lady Gaga that was just flat out hilarious. I remember that watching that. Yes, actually. that I mean it was just it, these see these frat guys doing Bad Romance. It was hilarious, but he was one of the co-founders of that group. So he uh, he has continued that by himself, and he does collaborations with other artists on YouTube. What what really gets me is you know like on the sing off, it takes an, a group of sometimes ten to fifteen people. If you watch that show, some of these groups come on there and they're huge. Um, it takes all of those people to simulate the sound with their voice of actually having musical instruments involved. What he does on all of his videos, not all, there are a few that have a musician, but he records all of the separate parts and then he puts them all together to make the whole song. So actually when you listen to it, all of the a cappella parts that are be being sung are him. And a lot of times he'll show you little, little pictures, that's part of the video is him doing all of the different parts. So it's really neat. It may not be your cup of tea or any particular person's. I had no idea that I would even like this before I happened to stumble across this thing off one day and was watching it and was just amazed that people could make that sort of sound doing a popular, a cover of a pop song and have it actually sound like there were musical instruments, instruments involved. So it just kind of, you know, turned me on my ear. I didn't know. I didn't know such things really existed, really. And let's see. You may have seen some of his videos. They get they get put around on Twitter quite a bit, um, but I don't think a lot of people pay attention as to who does them. He's got a neat one that's a a Disney medley that he does. He and this and another girl sing um, basically take clips from different Disney songs, and they sing them and. I guess it's become a thing nowadays to dress up like kind of like cosplaying for their videos. It's kind of cute. He's done covers from Imagine Dragons. He's done covers from Fun, and um, he's did a cover of Gautier's "Somebody That I Used to Know" that was pretty good. But my favorite songs that he's done is "Have You Seen the Desolation of Smog Yet?" I have not. Okay, I haven't seen it either, but there's a song I think they play at the end of that called I See Fire by Ed Sheerhan, I think his name is. I absolutely love that song. Well, Peter does an a cappella version of this song, which I love maybe more than the original, which is amazing because I really love this song. I've listened to it like nonstop since that soundtrack came out. And somebody first told me, oh, I love this song. And they tweeted a link to it. And I'm listening to it going, I love that song too. So I had to run to Amazon and buy it. And then I found on YouTube that Peter has a version of this song, which is just totally amazing. I love it. Everybody needs to go listen to it. And I will have a link up on the blog to the video, which is is a neat video. Um, not anything too too out there. There's no costumes in this one. One of his other ones that I love is Skyrim. I don't know if I, I haven't talked about Skyrim on here. Maybe I've mentioned it before, but I'm a big Skyrim player. It's one of my favorite games. I'm still playing it a couple of years after it's come out. And he does the theme song to Skyrim, which is a bunch of, you know, foreign words. They're chanting Dovahkin, and it's really, really cool. Uh, 
it, it's awkward on here for me to talk about music. I'm not as good as Kelly talking about Alice Cooper. I want to play a clip, but uh, we can't play a clip. So, But I'll have a link. He has a, a video up where he's actually dressed up like the Dovican from Skyrim. It's kind of dorky and adorable. But he's got another one with another artist people may know from her Game of Thrones theme. Lindsay Sterling is a violinist. And she does a cover of the Game of Thrones theme. And she has one with Peter doing some of the other sounds on it while she plays the violin. And they're dressed up in outfits from different scenes of Game of Thrones. That's a good one. They also have a Star Wars medley, too. But that might make you mad, Kelly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm going to have to check that out. Because there, there's choices that could be made there. <laughs> they, <laughs> they are doing it... Um, in fun from it you have to watch from the very beginning of the video they put in the Star Wars VHS tape so they're they're doing it in all fun but you yeah you have to see that it's done with love and not not get angry about it so okay. anyway um, there's a lot of cool stuff out there for for Peter he's got a couple of cover albums that are up available on Amazon though honestly the place that has the most of his songs, which are usually just available as singles, is iTunes. And he has a link on most of his videos to a service called Louder.fm where you can buy his songs for cheaper and he gets more profit from it because he's an independent artist. And I'm always harping on giving independent artists, whether they're musicians or authors or actual drawing type artists giving them uh, giving them a few bucks for the things that they put out in the world for free so check out Peter Hollins um, I love his stuff particularly the videos for Icy Fire and the Skyrim theme and I think all of y'all will be amazed at just how awesome it is well and given our rich multimedia capabilities we could we could likely embed one of the one or two of those videos in our blog post too to to have folks see it right from there. Yes, cool. we can. That'd be kind of fun. We haven't done a video embed that I'm aware of outside of some early playing around with the blog, so right. you can try that out. Cool. Yep. Yeah, I like it. So I'm I'm a little concerned by your caveats on the Star Wars thing, but I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna, that's probably going to be a place I'm going to start. Um, you just you just have to not take it too seriously. I mean, you know, we're, we're pretty serious Star Wars fans around here, and you just have to... You have to take it as they're being, they're being funny. It's not quite spoofy, but it is just a touch over the top. Just, just don't get angry. Don't let the Star Wars one turn you off. Gotcha. Well, I, it, well the more, <laughs> and you'd mentioned because I, I did watch most of the the second season of Sing Off because um, I think that group also did pour some sugar on me. They did. Uh, they did. I'll, pretty good version of that as well so yeah they uh, they had a lot of they had a lot of good stuff they did Kyrie too which is one of my favorite Mr. Mr. songs back from the day yeah they did they did a lot of stuff they really had a good a good song choice um, they weren't the best sounding as a group but they were fun they they were fun to watch and perform and I if nothing else you need to look up the the video for them doing bad romance on the sing off because that whole group was hilarious but i don't believe that peter was the lead singer on that song it was one of the other guys so. cool well, that's that's not weird at all that's a good one man oh, that's a uh, couple of caveats but, oh it's going to be straight ah, that's that's awesome Oh yeah, you know, i go I'll, from I'll, uh, <laughs> i go from cello, cello. music to a cappella yeah. yeah. just wait i'll i'll be bringing some I mean, I brought the bonzos in, so come on, it's not, you know, it's not exactly... Uh, and you should have told me, speaking of the bonzos, you should have told me that they did Monster Mash. Sorry. I would have known who they were if you told me that. I was listening to them on Spotify, and all of a sudden Monster Mash came on, and I was like, oh, Monster Mash! Because I love uh, that song. Did you get a chance to hear Hunting Tigers out in India? I did. I, I did. I liked a lot of their song. stuff. Their, uh, their their rock turn to the song called Tent uh, at some point's another really good one uh, but 
that's a that's a past recommendation we won't we won't dwell on for now. But cool. Well, we'll get some links out. Lots of links out. I think for for the. Uh, for him, uh, in terms of video and, and the music and those types of things, and uh, I'm going yeah. to, uh, with the appropriate caveats, make my way to that Star Wars one pretty quick, and I, I won't <laughs> judge. I, you know, I liked Spaceballs. I thought Spaceballs was hilarious, and that's about as you know, kind of mocky funny as you can get. True. The Star Wars franchise, so I should be able to make it through. One would hope. Yeah. Oh. All righty. I think it's Twitter recommendation time. Would you like to go first today, Mel? Um, sure. Uh, my recommendation this week is Orlando Jones. He is at the Orlando Jones. Um, if any of you are Sleepy Hollow fans out there, as many people are, you are really missing something by not watching um, Orlando Jones's Twitter feed during the show. He is uh, he is hilarious and he snarks on his own show. Every show out there should have Orlando Jones promote their show on Twitter because he's hilarious. Or I think late yesterday he um, he tweeted a, a link to an NSFW fanfic picture of uh, from from Sleepy Hollow that someone had drawn and put up on a Tumblr. So of course I had to go look at it and no it was not safe for work. <laughs> so it was loads of fun. He's a great promoter of that show and he's just hilarious. Jeans and I love him, and uh, we ended up watching Evolution again the other day, just That's because, good. just because he was in it. He he's awesome in it, you know. And I'm I'm not uh, the largest David Duchovny fan uh, on the planet. I found him palatable uh, in that movie. Shame on you. Uh, but <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but the Jesse Pinkmans of the show, <laughs> the two, uh, yes. the two. Uh, those those guys were awesome. They, they were Jesse cute. Pinkman before Jesse Pinkman ever That's came. Right. Yes. Yeah. They were cowhouse Jesse Pinkman. Yeah. <laughs> they were just uh, that. Uh, yeah. The house where the cows live. Cowhouse. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, people. Breaking Bad will f often find its way into this show. <laughs> As it should. Yeah, we may just have to have a, just a show dedicated to at the beginning. Say, well, we're recommending Breaking Bad. All we're gonna do is just talk about our favorite parts for our show. That's right. <laughs> there's just so there's so much uh, there. Cool. Um, yeah, and uh, you had mentioned uh, recently uh, when you and I were chatting about because uh, I had not been following Orlando Jones. Uh, I've corrected that, uh, and uh, and he is he's a great addition. Absolutely. Yeah, he's he is so funny, and uh, you know I just wish every show that we watched or or live tweeted had somebody like him to promote their show on Twitter because he does he does an amazing job. So he snarks his own show, which is what we do. So you know he fits right in. Excellent, very good. Okay, um, my recommendation uh, for this week is. Uh, a young lady named Kaylin Corrigan, and her uh, her Twitter handle is Killer Kaylin. It's K I L L E R K A L Y N. Uh, she is from Denton, Texas. So my neck of the woods. Yeah, she's from your neck of the woods. Um, uh, we've been connected on Twitter a while. She's a real fun uh, person to follow. She does a lot of the. The cons and the the different horror the horror um, uh, conferences and, and shows and all those types of things uh, will uh, writes a ton of reviews on horror movies uh, does all sorts of interesting content so it's it's in the it's in the definitely in that kind of um, thriller camp in terms of the the music stuff but she's got a a blog uh, where she'll um, pretty regularly either kind of cover some past past movies or upcoming movies uh, she gets a chance to sit down and talk with some pretty interesting people in the industry on it uh, and hits a lot of these things and comes back with uh, quite a quite a number of pretty cool photos with folks like oh Norman Reedus for example and all those types of Squee! things so, so uh, but she's just just the nicest uh, young lady and just knows knows her horror movies well good writer and fun fun uh, person so I've just uh, if if that type of uh, entertainment is something you like to kind of stay a little bit tuned into this person's got it going on there so I'd recommend following her I will definitely and a local girl that's right 
that uh, I was as I was coming up and said, ah, I'm going to recommend her. And I said, you know, I'm pretty sure she's awful close to Mel, as a matter of yeah, fact. So. Yeah, yeah. I might run into her at a con one of these days. I, I would think there's a distinct possibility. Yeah, cool. Awesome recommendation. All righty. So I think we got her, we got her covered. Yep. Uh, got our recommendations, got our Twitter uh, recs. Uh, again, if you, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, go to nurtureandsupport.net. Love to hear comments. Uh, love to see you comment on there. You can listen to the show there. You can go to iTunes and pull it down. If you do and want to write a review, it would be awesome. Appreciate that. Follow us on Twitter at nurtinsup, N-U-R-T-A-N-D-S-U-P-P. Email us at oh, yes. nurtinsup at gmail.com. Yep, we'd love. Yeah. We're gonna keep. We're gonna keep giving recommendations. But if you want recommendations within this decade, maybe you're gonna need to throw a few in. Otherwise, I'm gonna <laughs> keep throwing these old ones. <laughs> but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'd love to. Um, we'd love to kind of share some some other folks here. So don't don't hesitate uh, to to do that. And we know we've got a couple folks that are staying pretty connected to the show and listening on a weekly basis. So one of you would be awesome to hear from with a suggestion or two for us to add. A yes. la uh, Dan LaRock, who did a nice job for us a while back. He did. He did. Yeah, and Helena awesome. left a comment on uh, one of our episodes recently. Yay! So, so we're that was good. Little... We appreciate it. Thank you very much. But, yeah. yep, a review or two or, you know, hey, a tweet now and again. We would very much appreciate it because, you know, we're we're losing cred to the knitters. we we got to get up there. We want to kick the knitter's ass. <laughs> so you guys, have got, you guys have got to help us out here. They're cleaning our clocks right now. So it's kind of a humbling moment. Yes, yes. Who knew there were so many knitting podcasts in the world? Yeah. So, Well, thank you, everyone, for listening to another episode. And we will talk at you next week. Thanks, everybody. Nurturing and supporting journey.